What is up, y'all? It's your boy, Aniki, coming at you with a My Hero Academia Chapter 318 review. For those of you who don't know, we basically do the page-by-page -page breakdown. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. This is one of the best chapters in a while. Actually, if I'm being honest, the, the, My Hero has just been on a, a stretch. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think we've had a, a chapter that... Actually, no. If I'm being fully transparent, it, we haven't had a chapter that I was like, eh, whatever, probably since 2019. So that's where I'm at. But anyway, I'm just gonna we're gonna dive right in now. Keep the stretch going. We start off with Endeavor on the phone telling Deku we gotta switch up the approach. Um, you're not gonna last. You're you, you're you're wearing yourself out. All things that we know to be true. The major update here is like they're like the official dispatch dates for foreign heroes will be decided soon, and there's gonna be you know more personnel coming in to help expand the operation. And so with this, we know now that like there's there's like a time crunch and more than likely some of these heroes are going to be coming in around the time that like they've mobilized and the villains are already like ready. And so this just creates more people to throw into the fire, which means that like now this can be an international incident that like costs heroes around the world. But not only will that cause heroes around the world to look at Japan, but villains around the world. Allowing for this to expand into a proper global conflict if necessary. Because at the end of the day, All for One realistically would have had allies across the world. Even if he was just satisfied ruling Japan, different outside sources. You remember I mentioned how, you know, we had the incoming Russian naming the villains. And then we had Lady Nagant with those kinds of ties. It kind of seems inevitable that if we're going to get foreign heroes, we're going to get foreign villains too. Or people who... Uh, would have been foreign heroes, but they are sympathetic towards the MLA cause. That ideology can't only exist in Japan. The, that idea of liberation and freedom is something that would have been spread. When you think about how much newscasting there would have been involving these incidents, it's definitely clear that some people would have been able to ponder the political ideology that was being posited. Uh, we get this Deku Venom panel uh, where he's just like, I'm still on my feet. I, can, I can't give villains time to prep. And he hangs up on the deck. And we notice that he's always got these extra tendrils, you know, we got the one for all charges. He's constantly using Black Whip to help himself keep moving. And we get one of the most important callbacks we've gotten in a while. And it's immediately like a reference to when Shigaraki left his family behind to decide to pursue that journey of being the ultimate villain lord. Where the vestiges are like, hey, look, Ninth, you, you aren't healed and... You know, it's not time to be throwing a caution to the wind, which basically, like, the thing that's, like, a small little flag in this that bugs me is that they're not completely upset at the idea of this kid dying and sacrificing himself. They want him to die or sacrifice himself at the right time. So even the vestiges are kind of seeing Deku as, like, a proxy for their will, for their, and they're, like, losing even though they're like, most of them are maintaining sight. And it's important to note also that the vestiges who are talking to him in this are the sixth. It looks like Shinomori, looks like we got Nana and we got Yoichi. Those four specifically kind of pulling up and they're the ones who are like trying to get him to stop. And then the danger sense goes off, Deku takes off and Shinomori is kind of like, ah. And we immediately cut back into the inner world where now you've got the six users or seven user, previous users who are all at their seats but it's important to note that the second user is still standing, which means that I don't think Deku has access to the second user's quirk yet. That is still sealed. It's the people who are sitting whose quirks he can access. He can use Fajin. He can use Black Whip. He can use, you know, One for All as his, you know, base. He can float. He can smoke screen, and he can Danger Sense. But whatever the second user have has is being held back by him not being officially in that chair. That's kind of what that means. Like as he's unlocking those quirks, I'm pretty sure that's what that symbol is. That's what that's for. So Nana blames herself, you know, like, hey, if I hadn't like put those feelings on, it was mine. And like Daigoro is like, no, this isn't because of the burdens you placed on him. Daigoro has a better read on him in this situation than some of the, than what Nana is reading on here, where Deku will not hesitate to save anyone. This is, again, something that was emphasized in provisional license exam when Toga was disguised as Ochako. She straight up said, you will save anyone. 
This is why when last week when I said people have to realize that this isn't a different Deku, this is the same Deku carrying out his typical feelings to the extreme and sacrificing himself and like putting and saving people over everything else. That's just always been who he is. So just remember that for people who only just now got on the Deku wave, this is the same Deku you saw in Provisional License. At least this part of his personality is anyway. Now, uh, Shinomori, somewhat like for better or the worse, the manifestation of his purpose has been able to act on his primary motivation, even says it by the way, and he seeks to save everyone. And what the second user says is that he's choosing the right path. While a lot of people are worried, he makes it a point to clarify like he can't sit still and be inactive anyway. With everything going on in the world, with the dangers that are at present, this is effectively a war. And unlike Yoichi and the third user or, or any of these other people, the second user is very clearly being painted as someone who has had to lead people through adversity and also experience it. And he understands the weight of carrying those bodies. Because at the end of the day, the first user, yes, had some important like, roles in this, but he mostly was a prisoner that eventually passed his quirk on. He, he, he wasn't the dude that was out here like fighting with one for all. He, he wasn't doing all that. Just kind of chilling in the basement, stockpiling power, nothing too crazy. Um, the gauntlets that we see on the second user, though, I'm looking at them and they don't seem to have a port. And if this is supposed to be like Bakugo in the past, then I would expect his gauntlets to have an actual port on them so that he can like fire off. I wouldn't be surprised in the long term if we do still get some kind of connection, whether it be familial or whatever to really make this make sense. But if, for example, if you really want to entertain that theory that Bakugo time traveled, then the issue becomes like, how has nobody figured out that, that like none of the users can tell that this is him? And he, do they not know his name? Has he hidden his name from everybody? Because at the same time, it is worth noting that most people use their name, Shinomori, Banjo, whatever, and he only gets referred to as a leader. So, like, I don't think it's necessarily that that's Bakugo, but if you want to argue that that's where those pieces are and that's why it's being used that way, just also realize that the gauntlets don't fit, the hair color doesn't fit, and Bakugo would likely just prioritize getting Deku's safety and would probably give him his quirk as soon as possible. Instead of, like, making him wait, unless he's, unless the, your argument is kind of, like, from the foundation of he's waiting until Bakugo goes back in time to explain that he is Bakugo. But there's no way of knowing that, so... We, we see Deku's saving some civilians who are being attacked by a crowd of mutants. And I think the main reason why we're finally seeing some of these mutants cut out and be a little villainous, obviously there's the people who were released from Tartarus and you see that there's a stain slash spinner fanboy in the crowd, but he seems to look kind of like Octopusian or whatever. Like a lot of these people have also been discriminated against during their lives and if things are wild and they need resources and they're gonna go take that. But the fact that a lot of people are trying to make their travels without hero guidance means that a lot of people really underestimated how quickly madness would descend but also realize that as people have been getting pulled into ua as people are getting pulled into the ketsubutsu campus as people are getting pulled into shigetsu high they're also creating vacuums where there are no people living in these areas and in the process they're allowing themselves to be slowly surrounded by villainy so the idea of the country being in the hands of the heroes is kind of like an illusion because it's like you got these bases all over, sure, but the, sec the second you go on the streets, it's the villain's territory. So effectively, the, the good guys, if you will, are running the country more or less in name only. And that's kind of a scary thing to think about. And speaking of fear, once Deku actually drives off the people who are attacking, they freak out and they're like, wait, you have multiple quirks. Are you working for all for one? And he's like, no. And they're like, great, glad to hear it. And they run away, which this also likely means that a lot of the villains deck who's been encountering, like the one who had the maiden tattoos, etc., likely have been given second quirks at least. And he's been besting them. And so it's becoming more and more known that all for one is giving different villains second quirks, third quirks, whatever the case may be. Um, so that they can be more powerful and that allows them to associate Deku with all for one which kind of means that like over time he's going to have to explain it eventually to people but it's not going to be the same way or like the same perspective 
And it's kind of important to note that after this, Deku like is literally relying on Float, and the Black Whip tendrils stay around to make sure he can stay in action. And he's pondering what he wants to, what awful one is after. He's got to, like, I got to stop Shigaraki. I got to stop the league because they don't know where Toga is. So she's in the wind. Dobby went out of his way to do all this stuff. You see Spinner. We know Compress is in custody. So that's why he's not in the panel. And we know that Maki got caught. We don't know where Maki is, but that's the situation. And then we get the cutback. And I talked about how awful one loves to steal and co-opt All Might's phrases and use them as his own. And we get a cut back to that now it's your turn. And the, the the time period of that now it's your turn, it's really like significant to note that when we had that moment in Kamino, Daku highlighted how a lot of people would have been optimistic and they would have thought like All Might was like threatening the criminals and lifting up people and encourage like sending a message of encouragement, but he would have taken it as a sign that it was the end of All Might's era, he needed to step up, and he needed to become more powerful. And now having both of those people's words coming back into his mind, saying the same phrase, telling him it's his turn, is going to allow like the things that he attached to All Might as safety and the things that he views as danger to become one in his head, which also kind of, I don't know if I want to say that there should be a conflict, but there's definitely likely going to be one coming up. Um... We see that he's fighting giant villains in the middle of the ocean and like he's making like water pressure. Deku's getting a lot of on the job experience. Uh, we see that he does eat, it looks like he's eating a protein bar, staying nourished. Now one of the things that I think I talked about last week and I know I just talked about it on stream is that while All Might was Deku's primary mentor, a lot of the way he's operating these days stems directly from Aizawa. From Aizawa being a person who barely eats because it's not rational and instead prefers those jelly pouches that you've seen him like slurp on in the anime which are just filled with nutritional supplements to so and we even see that like when he's pondering the people who've influenced his life you see him cutting back to his mom you see grand torino eating the taco or not the takoyaki the pastry you see all might you see uh aizawa and eri deku creating all these smoke clouds just going out of his way to like scare people and like get them to go away kind of becoming a symbol of fear instead of a symbol of peace that uh he was supposed to be and instead he's kind of doing the hit and run assassin tactics and scaring people both allies like the people he wants to protect and his enemies in a lot of ways and Deku kind of references the uh the, the hawk's curse about the cherry blossoms and smiling together again and we get a page of him contemplating every member every single member of class 1a from Mineta to Shoji to Koda to Bakugo to Araka to Sato to Shoto, and each of them original, like new drawings uh, designed to like highlight who Deku is and like what drives him forward. Um, and we finally get introduced to another villain, the one who looked like the hash slinging slasher in the shadows, and his name ends up being uh, Dictator. And he's got a quirk similar to Shinzo in that he can control people but it's very clearly different because he can control masses like large amounts of people and they stay conscious through it all they can't control their bodies but they can keep moving he knows that he like and he tells him straight up you know i'm gonna take you in so i can secure myself a position in this reign of all for one uh he's and deku immediately starts with the interrogations even though he's like tired and he quotes sends the ignorant masses after him which the kind of the the thing about this fight that a lot of people will have to think about especially the people who ran at him is even though this kid is scary even though he's got like the dark tendrils and the battered clothing and all this other stuff he chose to like slowly let us try to overtake him more than likely he's just gonna do he would have just done like a 45 percent jump to get up into the air and like he would have accidentally blown some people away but it would have stopped him from being like pinned and we get the explanation of the mechanics of the dictator's quirk that allows him to control people, which is that you effectively have to use a very strong blow or like knock them out like the people that so he can't control people who are unconscious or you just knock out that uh, dictator himself. And of course, he had meat shields and all these other things. And as Deku's getting swarmed and you see his arm reaching out as if he's like reaching for someone to save him even though he's sitting here talking about how he needs a strategy and how he's planning on saving them they don't need to be worried they will be fine the strategy ends up not being 
anything of Deku's design, but rather we get my boy Bakugo pulling up and the first thing he says is that punk, but we see he's got an aerial view and a perfectly placed sniper shot into the dome of uh, Dictator with the AP shot to the extent that like you don't see any blowback hitting any of the civilians next to him. You don't see any of them being targeted by it. You just see him like getting hit, them being nervous. And then um, we get that cut back to the phrasing of the second user quirk when he was like, if there's anything that could bolster Deku right now. And then we get the picture of Bakugo and he says, he's here, guys. The power behind that phrase though, with the look on his face, this, is, this isn't this is angry Bakugo, the grumpy boy that like yells at you and is like all mad and constantly shouting. This isn't, I do everything on my own, I'm the champion Bakugo. This isn't, if you're working for me, you're a lackey, you're an underling Bakugo. This isn't, you're an extra Bakugo. By saying he's here, guys, this means he's been searching for Deku, he's been coordinating with them, and he's been trying to find them. Most of 2A has likely been making moves this entire time. And we talked about this in the Bunny Man video. That Bunny Man mythology where people were talking about the person with multiple quirks, the way he was traveling, consistently going after high value targets, taking out villains left and right, blowing smoke everywhere. Bakugo, also keep in mind, keep in mind, this is a small detail, but Bakugo being there when Deku's quirks were discussed, and he saw what most of them would be is what led him to being able to track down Bakugo. Because as people are talking about, oh, this guy with multiple quirks, he's got, you know, he's got these tendrils. And he's like, okay, tendrils, yes, yes, what else? Oh, oh, and he, he seems to like react to things in like fast. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's really strong. Yup. Oh, he can float and fly. Ah, and he generates smoke screen. All of these are quirks that Bakugo was fully aware of Deku having. The only quirks that Bakugo doesn't know about Deku having are Fajin and whatever the second user is eventually going to give him. Those two. So he left a trail of evidence that anybody who knew the secret of one for all would be able to track him down and find him. And thanks to the other kids knowing too, they likely talked to Bakugo. There's a, I told y'all before, there was a reason why he hid Bakugo's reaction. There's a reason why we didn't see Shoto's reaction. And it's because they were being saved for right now. Shoto carried all his family secrets and didn't share them with Deku. So I don't think he's going to pull up in the next chapter and be mad at Deku for lying to him. Instead, he's going to look at it as Deku's burden because he did, it's not like he told them about Toya, right? And Ochako is likely going to be around too. His team is here. And one of the most important things about this is that all of this is happening in Kamino at that ground zero. The I am not here statue is right there. It's right there. So Bakugo, whose original design and hero name was going to be ground zero, is at ground zero with Deku, where back there, his kidnapping caused the fall of the symbol of peace in his mind he is currently here to save the current symbol of peace at ground zero from deku having parallels with shigaraki to deku and bakugo having these parallels back then the next thing that i can expect because as much as people talk about deku versus kachan 3 we got to talk about how we get to deku versus kachan 3 and i don't think this will be the time where bakugo is initiating that fight or coming at him reckless more than likely that 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 reaching out in the middle of the river scene that you get with deku and bakugo that we're always calling back to that motif of reaching out the fact that deku's hand was raised in a sense that could look like he was reaching out for help when you factor all of those things in the the thing that i expect bakugo to be doing here is to free these people from dictator and then i expect while deku's still laying on the ground for him to reach out his hand and try to pull Deku back. And if we're going to get a Deku versus Kachan 3, it'll be because Deku rejects that hand. And this also allows for it to be a reasonable fight between the two. Because you normally be like, well, Deku's way stronger now at this point. He's got 45% Black Whip, all these like mechanics, but he's also exhausted. So if he decides to try to fight Bakugo in what I consider to be the Stardust Breaker Explosion mode, it's not happening. Because Bakugo's main goal here will be to save Deku. Could Deku totally wipe out his whole class here and like beat their asses? Sure, that could be the route we're going, but I don't think it is. 
We also got confirmation that Deku doesn't have access to Air Force techniques because those are channeled, unless he's got his gloves on. Which even that, I've always said, Air Force was Deku catching up to Bakugo in another way. If you think back to when we got past Hosu City and we were going into the final exams arc, Deku was replicating Bakugo's movements as he was jumping along the building and stuff to try to be fast. He needed a ranged attack and he needed to make sure it was focused and not too destructive, just like when Bakugo came up with AP Shot and he needed to make sure it wasn't going to destroy everybody. He needs to make sure there's not a bunch of collateral. So he learned how to focus and that made Air Force and he could like rapid fire that out, just like the AP Shot rapid fire cannon. And now, so this whole coming to a head of all these different things that he's incorporated from his different friends and allies is now here and we get the whole if you've been copying them are you as good as them or better you know that's something that gets to be on the table now and i this chapter like stellar and for what it'll mean for the series going forward and these next couple chapters and how the students get incorporated or whatever like that i'm really looking forward to it so i'd love to know what you guys thought about this chapter it's extremely like it, this is like a milestone in the series for me because it also highlights like bakugo just looking simply like he cares like he's worried not shouting communicating with the class not disrespecting them coordinating with them he's finally like stepping into that leadership role that his character has kind of like been set on this path to have i want to hear your thoughts what do you think um there won't be Church of MHA next Sunday or a review for MHA next Sunday due to the whole it's on break until July 11th. Well, there will be an Invincible stream on this channel. We'll be discussing the show uh, to make up for the fact that there's no superhero manga next week. And um, so, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I've been doing a rewatch reread lately, so I'll be doing some videos on the earlier arcs and likely just doing videos on every arc in the series or at least... A couple stretches of arcs like forest training and Camino might be combined in a one arc video discussion and uh, like the first season of MHA is probably going to be one video but you'll get to have that and we'll be running through the series and talking about the way a lot of these arcs set up events and what it is and what it all means in the bigger picture of the series so I hope you you know subscribe follow stick around for all that stuff and just you know enjoy the content while I you know keep making it uh, this is Anaki, Church of MHA Cardinal like share subscribe comment let me know what you think if you really feel like balling you can join and i'm out